Students rally outside Planned Parenthood. Will their pro-life message affect the presidential race? Evangelicals stand for life. Why they're joining Catholics for the March for Life. Washing the feet of women. The Pope invites more people into a Holy Thursday tradition. And bracing for a blizzard. How the March for Life responds to wintry weather. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Thursday, January 21st, 2016. I'm declaring uh, a state of emergency for the District of Columbia. A sudden blast of winter threatens the 2016 March for Life. The National Weather Service issues a rare blizzard warning and Washington DC braces for the worst. Good evening, thank you for joining us from Washington. I'm Brian Patrick. The National Weather Service says the winter storm could paralyze the mid-Atlantic. From the north. It is crucial for people to stay off the streets. To the south. Winter has finally arrived in North Carolina. Millions are prepping for a wicked winter weekend. In Washington, D.C., it was chaos before the storm. Less than an inch of snow turned highways into parking lots Wednesday. You don't know for how long it will take. One hour, two hour, five hour, six hour. Even the commander in chief couldn't escape the D.C. disaster. His presidential motorcade stuck in the snow with everybody else. I would have hoped that um, they would have uh, anticipated this a little better and treated the roads. The city admitting this morning it messed up. We are very sorry for an inadequate response. Mayor Muriel Bowser said despite the failure overnight, her city will be ready for the big blizzard this weekend. We will treat this event as a homeland security and emergency management uh, event in the District of Columbia. The nation's capital is expected to get the worst of it. A staggering 30 inches of snow is possible. Virginia has the National Guard on standby and Maryland is bracing for the worst. We anticipate the heavy, wet snow could result in downed trees and disrupted power lines with the potential for considerable power outages. But the reach of the storm is massive. Tens of millions of people from the southeast to New England could be spending the weekend snowed in. And National Weather Service meteorologist Chris Strong tells us this is a monster storm. A blizzard warning is a combination of heavy snow and uh, low visibility and winds. So uh, we're expecting all that, especially as we get later into the night on Friday night and pretty much through a good part of Saturday with winds uh, gusting in some places up to 50 miles an hour. Uh, visibility is down a quarter mile or less. So it really it moves from being a transportation problem to being really life and death situations where people can get disoriented, trapped. If they have an accident on the roads, they can really get in harm's way very quickly. So this should be taken very seriously, this warning. Yeah, it's not something we issue very often at all. You know, once, you know, once a decade, probably on average uh, in this part of the country. So it's uh, something everybody should be taking very seriously. March for Life participants have faced wintry weather before. Organizers posted pictures this week on their Facebook page showing previous marches. In some, you can see heavy snow on the ground, but we don't recall ever facing a blizzard. EWTN just brought you live coverage of the opening mass of the National Prayer Vigil for Life. Tonight, Jason Calvi reports on visiting pro-lifers trying to make a difference here in Washington. Jason? Brian, the mass puts prayer at the beginning. Tomorrow, pro-lifers will march through the streets of D.C. on the anniversary of the Roe v. Wade the Supreme Court decision which legalized abortion. And already today, pro-lifers are standing up for life. The snow and cold doesn't stop Planned Parenthood's work today. The organization is building a new abortion clinic in the nation's capital. Some are praying it won't open. Why are you out here in the freezing cold today? To save babies, not to pray, to, to be part of the whole movement to stop killing our babies. The numbers joining that call at the March for Life might be smaller because of the blizzard, but one number is on everyone's mind. 2016. Oh, I believe 2016 is one of the most vital years ever to the pro-life cause. Brian Kemper is the youth outreach director for Priests for Life. This generation is on fire for God. This generation is on fire for life. And I believe that they will elect a pro-life president that will help us be the generation that abolishes abortion. We took an informal poll of some of those pro-lifers. I like Rubio. I like Ted Cruz. Two from this group from St. Louis like Senator Cruz and three like Senator Rubio. 
Do you think there's a worry that, that he'll get elected and then not do these sorts of things once he's in office, protecting life, defunding Planned Parenthood? <sighs> I guess there's always a worry, but I feel like people like us that keep on with the with the march, keep on with the fight, that uh, we'll put that pressure on them to make that change. What about the Democrats? Anybody over there that you're watching? No, nobody. Planned Parenthood took the rare step to endorse someone in the primary, picking Hillary Clinton. Anybody here looking at the Democrats, Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders? <laughs> Thank God, no. no. <laughs> Now, National Right to Life does tell me there are some Democratic members of Congress that do receive it, the group's favorability rating. Uh, and of those I polled today, several expressed hesitation with the Republican frontrunner Donald Trump because his views on abortion have changed over time. Politics aside, though, tonight is all about prayer leading up to tomorrow's March for Life. Brian? Jason Calvi, thank you. And hundreds of evangelical Christians are here in Washington supporting the March for Life. Wyatt Goolsby is just back from the Evangelicals for Life conference. Wyatt? Yeah, Brian, evangelicals from across the country say their goal this week is to help spread a pro-life vision of compassion. Now, this is not just for Christians who are strictly evangelical. Today, we saw a variety of Christians from different denominations, all speaking on a wide range of issues related to the pro-life movement. One of those speakers today is Jim Daly, the president of the Christian advocacy group Focus on the Family. He spoke to us about how evangelicals can better promote a culture where every child is wanted. It's such a core um, ethos to our faith, you know, that we're made in God's image, especially that baby in the womb. I mean, and for us to be able to at least provide a voice for that child or those many children, now 52 million, who have uh, lost their lives through uh, abortion, um, I can't think of anything more important to be doing. So I think the evangelical community is waking up to that in a greater way. Uh, we've been there, but we haven't been there in the way that the Catholic community has. So I think coming together uh, is terrific. Daly also went on to talk more about other pro-life topics, including the importance of Christians being willing to adopt orphan children. The Evangelical Conference has events tonight and tomorrow leading up for the March for Life. Brian? Thank you, Wyatt Goolsby. Other stories our EWTN News Nightly team is covering in today's world. Russian President Vladimir Putin probably approved a plan to kill a former Russian agent. A British inquiry releases this as one of its findings a decade after the death of Alexander Litvinenko. Sir Robert Owen, head of the public inquiry, says there's evidence Litvinenko drank poison tea at London's Millennium Hotel. On his deathbed at a London hospital, Litvinenko accused Putin of ordering his poisoning. His claim sent a chill through UK-Russian relations. A former U.S. Marine recently released from Iran says he's grateful to be home in America. Amir Hekmati was freed in a prisoner swap. Senator John McCain, a former POW, tells us he's happy the U.S. prisoners were released. He's also critical of the Obama administration for not being tougher on Iran. This administration has already, in the Bergdahl case, uh, establish that we will trade innocent, uh, we, would, we will trade guilty people for the release of innocent people who were taken <coughs> under in, deta in detention by the Iranians illegally. The president of Iran plans his first trip to the Vatican. The Catholic Herald says Hassan Rouhani is scheduled to meet with Pope Francis later this month. The Holy Thursday tradition of washing of the feet is no longer limited to men. EWTN News Nightly Rome producer Mary Shovlin joining us. Mary outlined the decree from the Vatican's liturgy office for us. A little bit of a surprise for us today, Brian. That's right. The Holy Father um, decreed today, we, the decree was made public, that on Holy Thursday, in that rite of the washing of the feet, that's part of Holy Thursday liturgy, now instead of just men and young men, and as, as is specified in the rite, uh, it's up to all the people of God, men, women, young and old, uh, lay and consecrated, to fully express more this, the fullness of the people of God. So those are the basic changes. Hasn't the Pope really demonstrated this himself in Holy Thursday liturgies? Exactly. This practice has been going on, first of all, in parishes throughout the world for some time. And after he was elected Pope, um, Pope Francis immediately started washing the feet of women at the Holy Thursday liturgy as uh, well as non-Christians. So another thing we're waiting to hear is this apply to non-Christians as well because the document specifies people of God. It does not say um, only Christian. So that's something we'll look for clarification on as this story unfolds. 
Our Rome producer, Mary Shevlin. Thanks for joining us, Mary. Thank you. Now, the Vatican holds its first official event of the Jubilee Year of Mercy. The Vatican says 3,000 people who work at shrines and holy sites were there. Pope Francis spoke to them about the beauty and the devotion of pilgrimages, especially in this Jubilee Year of Mercy. Francis passionately encouraged confession while on pilgrimage. E toccare con mano la sua misericordia. The Pope saying it's like touching the mercy of God with your hands. Archbishop Rino Fisicella, Jubilee coordinator, explains the Jubilee for pilgrimage workers. They are responsible for the organization uh, in all, all the, uh, the churches, the sanctuaries that we have around all the world. And uh, for us it was important that they could uh, listen to a meaningful word by the Holy Father. The Jubilee Year of Mercy is observed through the Feast of Christ the King this coming fall. Coming up, Father Scott Morton describes the growing pro-life movement, how it's spreading across the world. And meet a woman who once worked for Planned Parenthood. She now encourages others to protect women and their unborn babies. Thank you for joining us on this eve of the March for Life, the 21st on Thursday. People converging on Washington, D.C. for the March for Life have lots of company. The pro-life movement is spreading across the world. Father Scott Borgman, coordinating secretary for the Pontifical Academy for Life, joining us from Rome. Father, what's going on at the Vatican to globally connect with the March for Life here in D.C. tomorrow? Well, Brian, I know that Pope Francis is aware of the March for Life. In fact, not too long ago, he actually tweeted, I think it was last year, promoting the March for Life. And this is something that is kind of going on throughout the year. But specifically in this time, we're seeing that the marches are starting. It's kind of like starting in Washington. It's a wave that's going throughout the world. And we're seeing marches for life on all five continents. It is a growing trend, and certainly there is hope that this tide against abortion can eventually turn. What can the church do to turn the tide? The tide is indeed turning, and in fact, we're seeing on a, on a legal level globally, as, uh, as people begin to get more involved in promoting laws within their different countries, we're seeing abortion uh, permitting laws being overturned and uh, being able to present laws which are more favorable to life. Often pro-lifers are characterized as anti-woman. How can the church counter that? Well, I think the truth will set you free, as we all know. And um, the church is pro-woman because God is pro-woman. And God also happens to be pro-child. So this causes each of us on a global level, but also on an individual level, each person doing what they can, where they can, in order to promote this great gift that we each have and live, which is life. Father Scott Borgman with the Pontifical Academy for Life, thank you for joining us from Rome. Great talking to you again. God bless you all. And thanks for your blessing, Father. A prominent pro-life leader sees the Year of Mercy as a perfect fit for her ministry. Catherine Zeltner profiles former Planned Parenthood director Abby Johnson. A few years ago, you never catch Abby Johnson at a pro-life event. Now, she's a familiar face. I just know, I've seen her and I couldn't remember Abby. Yeah. Johnson became a powerful voice in the pro-life movement when she quit her job as a Planned Parenthood director and founded, and then there were none, ministries. There is no shortage of pro-life groups here in D.C. ahead of tomorrow's March for Life. But Abby says her group is different. They're reaching out to people still working in the abortion industry. The ministry helps abortion workers leave their job. In its three years, the group has seen over 200 people, including six abortion doctors, quit the industry. Uh, we believe that conversion is possible for every single person that works inside the abortion industry, for every single doctor. We don't believe that anyone is beyond the power of conversion because we don't believe anybody is beyond the power of Christ. Sue Thayer left her Planned Parenthood position. She's one of Abby's clients and agrees it's mercy that leads to conversion. It's, it's Christian. It reflects the love of Jesus. And standing in front of an abortion clinic praying 
and being kind and holding a sign that says I can help or look at the ultrasound, I have people that will adopt your baby, those kinds of things so much more helpful than, you know, the anger. And With her unique perspective, Abby says pro-lifers shouldn't consider abortion workers enemies, but should offer a message of hope instead. I wish I could explain to you the joy you're going to feel when you walk out of that door for the last time. Katherine Seltner, EWTN News Nightly. Thank you, Katherine. And Christopher Bell is president and co-founder of Good Council Homes. Chris, give us a glimpse of this growing network of homes that you have for women and their babies. We started in Hoboken, New Jersey in 1985, and that's our main office now. We have two homes in New York City, two in upstate counties in New York, one specifically for women who have a mental health or a drug addiction problem, and another home down in Riverside, New Jersey. But we're looking to expand in the mid-Atlantic states and in the south. God bless you. He is certainly blessing you with growth. So let's talk about when someone comes to you with a crisis pregnancy and they need help right now, what do you tell them? Call 1-800-723-8331 or go to goodcouncilhomes.org. Any woman in the United States can get help today, right now, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because wherever that woman is, we have connections and we can offer real hope and concrete help. So many people say that they're opposed to abortion, except in the case of rape or incest. How do you deal with women who have been raped or, God forbid, a young, a young girl is pregnant as a result of incest? Yeah. Uh, Angela was 12 years old. And when her mother brought her to us, she was conflicted because it was obviously within the family. But because we took her in and because she gave birth, the authorities were able to prosecute the right perpetrator and that young girl was safe not only with us but afterwards because too often Planned Parenthood would abort a young girl like that she'd go right back into that home it would be devastating for the rest of her life not that it wasn't already horrendous but at least we can begin the healing process and offer real real direction and guidance. That's a powerful point. Is it true that about one-third of American women have had a surgical abortion since 1973? Yeah, there's more than 52 million to surgical abortions, not including, you know, the contraceptive pill and the Depo-Provera and the other forms of so-called contraceptives that are really abortifacients. So, yes, and because of that, because of that, we who are pro-life, who know the truth, have to share the message of hope and healing and God's mercy. And even people who don't believe in God, who are upset or silently suffering because of their abortion, we have to tell them there is hope and there is healing. And Good Counsel Homes has a, a post-abortion healing program, and there are many other programs around the nation. We have to get the message out. Chris, you've been doing this for some 30 years now. So some of these women who said yes to life with your good counsel, now have grown children. Have they been happy with their decision? Well, one of the first moms who walked in, she's now the grandmother of, of eight. And I had lunch with her not too long ago, and she is as happy and thrilled as anybody that I can meet. Like yourself, Brian, who's a, a grandfather. You of know. eight, yes. Yeah, yeah. Blessed yeah, right. beyond measure. Yeah. Chris Bell with Good Counsel Homes. Thank you for your good work. God bless thank you, and you. thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you so much, Brian. God bless you. Up next, defending religious liberty. One state attorney general discusses the case before the Supreme Court. And supporting the Little Sisters of the Poor, people can now wear a button to stand firm with them. On Thursday, January 21st, thanks for joining us for EWTN News Nightly. I'm Brian Patrick. Life issues are at the center of the 2016 presidential campaign. Our political director, Lauren Ashburn, has more from the White House tonight. Brian, in presidential elections, the abortion issue has been a hot button, and this year is no different. The country remains deeply divided when it comes to the issue, and that's never been more clear than on this eve of the Right to Life march. In the election, the choice is clear. All Republican candidates are pro-life, and all Democrats are pro-abortion. Abortion, however, could play a role in just the Republican nomination this fall, as it has in the past. John McCain and Mitt Romney were both very pro-life, but too many people thought they weren't pro-life enough, or some conservatives thought they weren't conservative enough, and they didn't vote for them, or they voted for someone else. Uh, and what happened is that Barack Obama was elected twice, and unborn babies are paying the price. 
We cannot let that happen in 2016. Some polls show the majority of Americans support restricting abortion. A 2013 ABC Washington Post poll says 60 percent of women backed the 20-week limit. 51 percent of Democrats backed the 20-week limit. Some of the candidates, like Marco Rubio, are using this issue to stand out from the pack. He's created a pro-life advisory board, which he will use during his campaign and if he makes it to the White House. Brian? Lauren Ashburn at the White House. Thank you. And China's recent revision of its one-child policy allowing two children per family remains very troubling. Human rights activists say it will still result in forced abortions and sterilizations. Reggie Littlejohn is founder and president of Women's Rights Without Frontiers. Reggie, can you find anything positive in this change in policy in China? Well, yes, I, I think that the shift from a one-child policy to a two-child policy does enable 100 million couples in China to have a second child. I mean, that is a positive thing. But something that the viewers need to understand is that it does not mean that there's going to be an end of forced abortion or sex-selective abortion. In terms of the forced abortion, women who are not married are still going to be forcibly aborted, and third children will still be forcibly aborted. So will they continue this idea of aborting more baby girls than boys and, and keeping this gender balance just totally out of whack. Absolutely. Already in the countryside, where if you can, ha if your first child is a girl, you can have a second child. Where those second ch children are girls, they are routinely aborted. And I have no doubt that under a two-child policy, second daughters are going to continue to be aborted. Do you think that China's leaders will ever acknowledge that this policy, any policy like this, does more harm than good. Absolutely not. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party is completely unrepentant for anything that they have done with respect to population control. They are continuing to control the population through a two-child policy instead of a one-child policy. And I don't believe they will ever give up on coercive population control because I believe that part of the purpose of coercive population control is the intimidation of the people. So they will never give it up. It's a great tool for being basically what I would term domestic terrorists and keeping the people down. Is it a lost cause or is there anything we can do? Well, one thing that people can do is go onto my website, womensrightswithoutfrontiers.org, and sign a petition against forced abortion, acknowledging that this is continuing. And then the second thing is to, to uh, help with us with our Save a Girl campaign, where we've saved hundreds of baby girls in China. And of course, pray. Prayer always helps. Reggie yeah, Littlejohn, thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you. And 20 state attorneys general support the Little Sisters of the Poor in their legal battle over the government's contraceptive mandate. States include Texas, Ohio, Florida, Colorado, Michigan, and Wisconsin. They filed briefs with the Supreme Court. EWTN's own case remains in the lower courts, but will likely be impacted by the Supreme Court's decision. Our Jason Calvi asks Alabama Attorney General Luther Strange about his support for religious freedom. Well, religious liberty is our fundamental right. Really, it's in the First Amendment. It's something that's precious to all citizens in our country. Uh, I'm particularly interested in this case because EWTN is headquartered very close to where I grew up and where I live in Alabama. So I know the good work that they do in all religious nonprofits. And uh, what we're dealing with is uh, the aftermath, the effects of the Obamacare legislation that is forcing people with strongly held religious beliefs to do things that would violate those beliefs. We think that's unconstitutional. And there is a growing campaign to support the little sisters of, of the poor. People are wearing these cute little I'll have none of it buttons. The buttons offer to Obama's care, or they uh, refer rather to Obamacare's contraceptive mandate being forced on the religious order. The sisters say they are ordered to violate their Catholic beliefs or pay huge IRS fines. So wear these proudly. Until tomorrow for the EWTN News Nightly Team, I'm Brian Patrick. Stay with EWTN for everything you need to know about the 2016 March for Life. We leave you sharing a beautiful feast of St. Agnes tradition, blessing the lambs that provide wool for palliums. That's the woven garment worn around the necks of metropolitan archbishops.